Good morning, everyone. Welcome to all those who are here and to all of you that are picking this up on Facebook or YouTube. Welcome, and may God bless you all richly. We're going to skip through the book of Ruth today. It is a beautiful, beautiful story, and it deserves to be read in its entirety, but we don't have time in this venue. And it is about a Bible theme about redemption and the kinsman redeemer. So before we start, let's have a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the day that you've given us. Father, for this book, and the truths, and the beautiful stories that we find here. And we pray, Father, that you bless the hearing, the reading, and the speaking of your word this day, that you guide our thoughts and our steps, that we might glean from this beautiful book words of truth and life, and that you bless it to our hearts. And we ask these favors in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. So the book of Ruth, chapter 1. And we could go to the book of Leviticus and to the book of Deuteronomy and read what the law says and the instructions it gives about the law of redemption. But instead, let's look at the book of Ruth, which portrays two of the three elements of the law of the kinsman redeemer and see what it says to us from a human standpoint. The things of the law, a lot of it, and in particular things like the kinsman redeemer are pictures and portraits of Christ and we see the things that the law laid out which commanded them to do things that portrayed Christ. But the book of Ruth is a beautiful picture of it and it has the, the human element the things that happened in that day and that time. And we see that the things that the law taught were not only instructions about Christ, but this was a beautiful, beautiful thing in the Old Testament world where we didn't have welfare programs where things could get really, really serious for someone who was without means. And the law provided for that at the same time that it provided a picture and a portrait of Christ. So we're going to look at this from the standpoint of Ruth and Naomi and Boaz and then tie it to what the law instructed and how that teaches us about the Lord Jesus Christ. So Ruth chapter 1, the first five verses. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Mahlon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab, the name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Mahlon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husbands. So, the setting for the story is this. There were hard times in Israel, and Elimelech and his wife made a decision for the family that rather than stay here, we're going to depart because we've heard that things are better in Moab. Now there's some things that go on in that decision that we don't read written on the pages of the book. God promised to bless Israel in the place of blessing, which was in the land of Israel. And what we see here is an act of faithlessness to some extent, because rather than stay here and trust the Lord to see them through the famine, they left the place of blessing and the place of covenants and they went to dwell outside of that because it looked like to them the world would be better and more profitable and easier than to stay where the Lord put them. Is that something we can apply to our lives? Day after day after day, things of the world look better. They tempt us. They take us aside. They get in the way of remaining in the place of blessing. Things of the world interfere with your relationship with the Lord God. 
especially if you're in a covenant relationship with him, which these people were as members of the household of Israel. They're in a covenant relationship with God. Now, we have a different covenant. If you are a Christian, then you're in the New Testament covenant, which God relates to us through his son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. And we accept him as Lord and Savior. That makes us in a covenant relationship. And everything that we do within that covenant, the things that we pursue, the way we spend our time, the way we control and handle our desires, the way we interact with other people, when we remain true and faithful and concentrated on, focused on the covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and the things that we do to interact with this world are through that covenant relationship, then blessings come. There's even a picture in the names that are given here. For Elimelech's name means something like God is king. And Naomi's name means something like sweetness and pleasantness. And the names of the two sons are sickness and failing. So it's a picture of what happens to the family. Out of the land of blessings, into the land of Moab, to suffer disaster. So they've spent 10 years in Moab. Elimelech is dead. Mahlon and Chilion are dead. And Naomi is left at her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. Naomi decides that she's going to return to Bethlehem. And they get everything all gathered up, and we're not going to read it, but there's one of those neck-hugging, snotting, bawling, crying sessions. And Orpah goes back to her people. But Naomi and Ruth have a different kind of a relationship. And if you look at verse 16 and 17, Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. My people, thy people shall be my people. And thy God, my God, where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. You know, there's a whole lots of things said there. That's, that's a beautiful statement. But this young woman has pledged out of loyalty and love to her mother-in-law some very important things. Whither thou goest, I will go. Where was Naomi going? She's headed west. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. And she's going to quit traveling west when she got to where? Bethlehem. This young woman says, I'm going to follow after you to the place that you're going, and I'm going to stay there in that place where you stay. And I'm going to make your people my people, and I'm going to take your God to be my God. And I have made this commitment to the point that nothing is going to separate me from you except death, and I will die there in Bethlehem. Y'all, she chose to go out of the Gentile nation, Moab, and to go into God's covenant people, Israel. That's like a choice to leave this world and to enter into a covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. She is a Gentile bride. The church is pictured as Christ's Gentile bride. So this young woman decides to leave all that she knows, the land of Moab, and to accompany Naomi to the place where God's covenant people are, and to make that her permanent home, and to take those for her permanent people. When we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, <coughs> when we come to the place where we understand our lost and ruined condition, we leave this world behind and we enter into a permanent relationship with Jesus Christ. And we're there in the company of all of his covenant people. Those who are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, we make that permanent. And nothing is going to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Physical death will come, but it won't separate us from that. Ruth was looking at physical life, and she knows that someday death is going to separate her and Naomi. 
but she's going to remain faithful to what she has pledged here as long as she has breath. What a beautiful statement. What a wonderful statement of loyalty and love and commitment. Oh, we'll skip over now to chapter 2. And they have come to Bethlehem. And without saying a whole lot about it, we can understand kind of the situation that they're in. Two widows in a land where women were in some ways disrespected. God didn't intend for disrespect to be, but he put things on men in the way of responsibilities and men misused those things. So not to Israel, but to other parts of that Old Testament world and even to lots of that world today, to the Middle East, a woman is regarded almost as property. If you read about Islam and the Sharia law, why in the world would a woman convert to Islam? You wouldn't want to do that. A woman is property under Sharia law. And that's the way a whole lot of the old world was. And these, these two ladies are in an unhappy situation. They don't have any means. We see that because we know that Naomi and Ruth arrive in Bethlehem and they've found a place to stay and now what are we going to do? They don't begin to ply a trade. They don't what we know is that in order to have food, Ruth goes to a field that's being harvested, the barley harvest is on. And she goes behind those who are reaping the grain, like other people who are without means, and she's gleaning what gets dropped. That's what they're going to eat. She's going behind men who are harvesting grain, and she's looking here and there and finding the bits and pieces that, get, that fall on the ground. So that's where she is at this point. And it just so happens that Naomi has remembered something. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. So here enters in another name. Boaz is in the genealogies of Christ. If you turn to Matthew chapter 1, and it talks about the genealogies of Jesus, how he is a descendant of Abraham and in particular is a descendant of David the king and he's the heir to the throne of David. Boaz is in there and so is Ruth. Three women are named, are, are named in Matthew chapter 1 in conjunction with the genealogy which follows the man's name. One is Rahab, the other the second is Ruth, and the third is not given a name, but she's called the wife of Uriah, which we know to be Bathsheba. So the faith and the statements and the loyalty that youth that, that Ruth has given make her to be such a person that in the listing of the ancestors of Jesus Christ, God chose to name her by name, Ruth, said Boaz beget, I can't remember which one he beget, grandfather of Obed, he beget Obed of Ruth, who's in the genealogy of Christ. But now we introduced here Ruth chapter 2 to Boaz, and we see that he's a wealthy man and a respected, and it says a mighty man of wealth, and he is a near kinsman which is important because in Naomi's thinking, well, what about the old law of redemption? We have some options here. And Ruth goes forth to glean in the harvest. And it just so happens that she finds her way to a field which is owned by Boaz. Read the story. It's a beautiful story. We don't have time to go verse by verse and read the story. But she catches the eye of Boaz, who knows about Ruth, that she's come home with Naomi, and that she's placed love and loyalty to Naomi. And he has seen the way she conducts herself, and he knows that this is a good person. 
and a loyal person. And now she's come and she's gleaning in my fields and out of compassion for Naomi and for Ruth and for the goodness that she has demonstrated, Boaz actually instructs his men to drop handfuls of grain for Ruth and to watch over her and protect her. So she comes home to Naomi. Naomi wants to know what's been going on. Well, it just so happens I wound up in Boaz's field and he took notice of me and told me not to go to any other place, but you stay until the harvest is finished with my people. Naomi's ecstatic. And her mind is turning, Ruth, that man is a near kinsman. And she remembers and she instructs Naomi. Or Naomi instructs Ruth about what to do. If you look at chapter 3 and verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whom maidens thou wast? Behold, he went with barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down, that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie. And thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down. And he will tell thee what thou must do. Now, in a moral society, this kind of looks out of place, doesn't it? Ruth, you sneak down to the barn where he's winnowing grain, and after everybody's left and he's gone to bed, you slip over and crawl under the covers. Well, not exactly because she didn't crawl in there and snuggle up to the man. She lay down at his feet, and she pulled a corner of the cover over her. And she's placed herself in a posture where she has come to him with a petition, and he knows immediately what the petition is when he recognizes who is there and why. She's come to me, and she's offered herself to me in a proper way as a near kinsman, and you'll find the instructions in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 and 6, where a man is instructed to take the wife of his deceased brother or any near kinsman, whoever's nearest of kin, and to take her out of a posture, position of being without. It was a hopeless situation for widows at that time. They didn't have the strength of a man to earn lots of money. They could wash and sew, but it wasn't going to make a lot of money. They were going to live in poverty. But if a near kinsman takes that person and makes a home with her, and according to the Bible's instructions, raises up a son or a daughter, the firstborn from that union is to be raised in the name of that who was dead. It takes a person from a hopeless situation like we are in a hopeless situation as lost and ruined and separated from God and it puts us in a covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and it pictures us in a relationship like a husband and a bride in a way that we can understand because that's something we do understand in the way that a man takes a wife and loves her and cares for her and makes things as best he can good for her like the Lord Jesus Christ does for us. This young woman who is a widow in a place in the time where that subjects her to a life of poverty has come to him with a request to do the act of a kinsman redeemer. It's not immoral at all, but it's very different from our customs, isn't it? We disregard things that God puts in place. It, at the same time, that it makes a life for this young woman. It portrays to us Jesus Christ. Y'all see that? But it also does something else because the Redeemer doesn't just make a home for this widow. He also redeems the property, which they haven't sold yet. But Leviticus chapter 25 
and Leviticus chapter 27 give the other two parts of the law of the Redeemer. If you've fallen on hard times and you had to sell a piece of property and now it's lost to you and you're still in poverty, if a near kinsman is willing and able, he can buy that property back for you. And that's important to us because how did God create us and where did he put us and under what circumstances? He created us in a beautiful place that's called paradise in the Garden of Eden. And it was the center of this earth at that time because it's where God's activities were. And he gave that earth to us as a possession. Sin came and we lost that possession into a bondage of sin. And one of the things that the Lord Jesus Christ does is restore a sinless human being and generates a race of sinless human beings so that we're purchased back from the bondage of sin. <clears throat> and our possession is restored to a rightful king who is not under the bondage of sin and shame. This is a picture of the Lord taking that which we lost. And he pays the purchase price to resolve the issue of sin between God and man, and in doing so, purchases our possession, which is the earth, out from under the realm of sin. Naomi and Ruth have not sold their possession, but they are without means. So it's on the market, y'all. And this is an issue now that Ruth has brought to Boaz at the prompting of Naomi, who knows the law. And what's Boaz's response? He didn't tell her to get away. He said, blessed are you. He regards this as an act of a virtuous person who comes to him with a proper request under the law to be a savior to them, like Christ is a savior to us. Now this doesn't show us the picture of the Redeemer for the person who is sold as a slave. But where were they going to go after the next few years if it went on like it was? Pretty soon they're going to be without means, they're going to be hungry. Most likely they're going to be, they're going to sell themselves as a servant so that they might live. And Boaz is going to be the savior to that. He's going to keep them from going into a life of slavery. He's going to restore their possession to them. He's going to restore Ruth from being a hopeless widow in a society where that subjects her to a life of, proper, of poverty. And he's going to make a better life for her. Christ does all those things for us. He redeems us out of a life of bondage. And we don't think of ourselves as being in bondage, do we? Are you a slave? Well, we're not. Those of us who are in the household of faith. But those who are not within that house of faith actually are the servants of sin. They are the servants of their natural self. They know nothing other than to do what I wish to do. And we teach children as they grow up to live within the boundaries of a society. So lost people have morals. Lost people have values. Lost people make good decisions because they've been taught to some extent. Like I was taught as a child to some extent. But I was still a servant of sin because that's what was in my heart. And when Christ came and changed me to a new creature, I still have the old nature, but I'm not a servant to it now because I can choose to serve the new. So all these pictures are coming in focus here. We don't see Naomi and Ruth in the posture of being a slave yet, but that was what was in their future. And for Boaz to do the act of a kinsman redeemer, he restores them to a proper place. He makes a proper home for them. He raises a child with Ruth in the name of the deceased. 
And it's a picture of something that we don't even see because we own property, we think, and we sell property, and we sell it forever, and we own it forever. And we're here, but just for a few brief years, and we're gone, but in our, if you want to say sinful mind, this is mine, and I own it. God says, no, the land is not yours. It's mine. And I have given it into your possession, and you are stewards of it. And I put this man on this piece of property when he allotted the portions of Israel to his covenant people, and he divided the land into areas where this tribe lived and that tribe lived, and they divided up the land within those tribes. That piece of ground on which Elimelech and Naomi lived before they went to Moab, which was under his possession, was not as the everlasting owner of that property, but he's the steward of the property that God put in his hand. So in doing this, they honor God's decision to give this to a certain person. Why is Israel, the tiny little speck in the Middle East, such an issue to the whole world? Because God had a purpose for it. Because God put a certain people there, and he gave it into their possession, and he is the king over it. And the forces of darkness the realm of sin fights against that, fights against everything that has to do with God. But it doesn't change God's plan and God's purpose, and that is that Israel remains there, that that is his place, and that his covenant people live there. And this is a picture and a tiny portion of that where Elimelech has this piece of ground that God gave to him. And it doesn't belong to anyone else. And Boaz is doing the part of a restorer as it is incumbent upon Naomi now to figure out what we're going to do. I own this piece of property. I'm going to be compelled to sell this piece of property in order that we might live. So it's for sale. But Boaz is not the nearest kinsman. There's another who is nearer. So he goes to this other person, and that's in chapter 4, verse 1, and we'll read that briefly. Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down, which is where they conducted business in that day and age. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, oh, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, kinsman, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants, before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou the right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. And here is another critical element of the law of the Redeemer. The Redeemer must be a kinsman. Why did Christ come to the earth and live as a human being? So he could redeem us, because he needed to have the redemption price. And the redemption price is a human life. <coughs> the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is the exact opposite, isn't it? The gift of God is life. So in order to redeem us, he had to pay the redemption price. Boaz had the redemption price, and he's willing. This man had the redemption price, and he was willing to have the land. And if you think for a moment, if he buys the land from Naomi, Naomi's well advanced in years. Her husband and her son's are gone, and there will be no more heirs. What happens to the land then? 
then he's the next of kin and he's the heir. If I take this and just provide a place for Naomi to live and feed her for a few more years, then it's mine. But Boaz in front of the elders of Israel said, you must also regard Ruth the Moabitess. She has come here with Naomi. She has placed herself under the covenant relationship because she has said, thy people will be my people and thy God will be my God and I'll stay there till I die. You can't just take the land and disregard Ruth because she comes with it. And Ruth is not advanced in years. And Ruth is a prospect of an heir. And you must take Ruth also and raise up an heir in the name of Elimelech and the name of Machlon. And the, re the other kinsman says, I cannot redeem it, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Y'all, Christ had the purchase price, which is a human life. And he was also willing to pay that price. You must be willing. And the other man wasn't. He was willing to get what he could for himself. I can't redeem that lest I mar mine own inheritance. Christ didn't regard whether he marred his inheritance or not. He came to us <coughs> to redeem us and purchase us out of the bondage of sin. To buy us out of a lost and ruined condition. And the cost was extreme. But he didn't pay attention to the cost because he was focused upon the purpose and the plan to restore that which was supposed to be from the day of Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve were created innocent in the garden, God had a purpose for us. And he knew that we would deviate from that purpose, but he also had a purpose by which he restores us. And that is what's pictured by the kinsman redeemer. That someone with the purchase price buys us out of a hopeless situation. He buys his Gentile bride, which is the church. He buys the individual, which is you and I in our lost and ruined condition. And he paid the penalty and the price for sin, which is a life that we might have eternal life. And he purchased this earth out from under the bondage of sin where Adam placed it when he became obedient to the realm of sin over which Satan is Lord. He purchases back our possession. He purchases back us as individuals. He purchases us back collectively as a church. The picture of the kinsman redeemer of the Old Testament is one of the sweetest and most beautiful pictures of Christ, our redeemer. And we see the human side of it also in the book of Ruth, which I encourage you to read in its entirety. It is a beautiful book. How God's love and God's laws provide and how they care for the people. He doesn't give us laws to live by that are odious and onerous for us. He gives us rules to live by that bring happiness and peace and joy in life. And when we get aside from, when we lose sight of our covenant relationship, when we get outside the things that God set in store for us, then things